Don't know those. <laughs> yeah, man. Right. Gary. Well, we'll start, if you could tell me a bit about your, your grandparents. Uh, my grand original name. My where, grandparents? Yeah, where they came from. Well, my maternal grandparents, he was James Russell and she was Annie McGee. She was a farmer's daughter from Green Island in County Antrim and he was from Larne. He was a Protestant and she was a Catholic. And in those times up in the north, even then, they couldn't marry. So he was an engine driver, train driver, and he emigrated to South Africa. And she went out later and got married either the day she arrived or the day after, married him. And they brought up their family there. They'd, I think that's seven children, brought them up in South Africa. And he drove the train from Cape Town to Simon's Town. That was his run. He was an engine driver all his life. He became a Catholic. So all the children were brought up as Catholics. The whole family is Catholic since then. Uh, my father's parents were from New Ross. My father was a pharmacist, but his father, the grandfather, was a shoemaker. He had a, a boot factory in South Street in New Ross. And the shop is still there. It's a preserved front just around the corner from the Tulsil in South Street. Um, my father was, had qualified as a pharmacist and was immigrating to New Zealand. And on the way, the ship broke down or something and there was a stop in Cape Town, which wasn't scheduled. And he went to sh they went to shore and he was brought to meet this Irish family who had four or five daughters. And my mother was one of them. And he stayed in South Africa. He didn't go to, he didn't go on to New Zealand at all. He stayed in South Africa and got a job there. And they got married out in South Africa and came back here on the honeymoon, on a, on a ship, obviously, on the liner coming back. And uh, meantime, his parents had secured the pharmacy for them in Main Street. It was, I think it was a druggist shop before that, which was owned by one of the sticky back powers. So they eventually bought the building. I was actually, I was actually born over it, over the shop. I think I'm the only person who was born in Main Street from that time. Okay. Then they bought the house over here no, no, they went to, um, sorry, they went to, I think the name of the house was Harbour View on, on the Donrail. They lived there for a couple of years and then bought this house next door. Have you any early childhood memories of Tremor? Of Tremor. Tremor was a very small place then. There was maybe 25 people, 25 girls in my class. So I suppose there would have been 25 boys in the boys' school. And that was the whole child population of that age group in Tremor at the time, you know. So you knew everybody. But the problem was everybody knew you. And if you did anything out of the way, the story was home before you. <laughs> but, um, Are, you, you were telling me you had memories of um, the train in Tremor, for instance. Oh, the train? Well, I would have eventually I would have gone to school to Waterford for a couple of years on the train. I used to run down the hill with Mary Daly. You'd hear the five-minute bell, we'd be tearing down Pond Road, down Train Hill. Then the, the conductor would come out and he'd ring the minute bell, but he'd wait until we got in <laughs> before the train would take off. But uh, I remember the day that the, well, the day after the train had come through the wall. The train couldn't stop when it got to the station and went straight through the wall of the station and landed on the road opposite what's now the Sands Hotel. It was the deluxe then, I think. And I remember my brother, my older brother, bringing me down on the bar of his bike to see it. The train lying on the road. Luckily, nobody was killed that time because there would have been crowds of people. It was race week. There would have been crowds of people going to catch the last train. So how they escaped, I don't know. It could have been. Would you attended the races yourself in those days? Oh, we did. Yeah, when I was at school, well, we used to go around and find a place where you could get under the. <laughs> 
there's cor sort of corrugated iron railing and you'd find a place where you could creep in and hope you wouldn't miss cut. And we didn't, we usually got in all right. We usually knew where to get in. They kind of leave the local children in all right. And where did you go to school in Tremor? Well, I went to school in Tremor to the local, to the Sisters of Charity up the road there, the Star of the Sea. And I loved it there. I was very happy there. And then I went into the Earth Line for a couple of years, but I hated it there. I was very unhappy. And then I ended up going to a boarding school and I was happy as Larry there then. Well, next door was Joe Galise's, I don't think many people remember it now, Arts and Crafts. It was a little black painted shop. It was would really be in the front room of a house, I'd say. It was a tiny little shop. We went up three steps into it. And Joe sold art materials, poster paints, Indian stuff. Indian headdresses or something, I don't know what he was doing with those. And uh, ammunition for for guns, you know, for shooting rabbits and that sort of thing. I remember he had a, a book where you had to record who you sold <laughs> who you sold the bullets to. Joe was sort of I don't know what he was, commander or something on the LDF in Waterford at the time. Shops on the main street. Well, the L and N would have been the main shop. It was quite small then, but busy. And then there was Matthews, Charlie Matthews, which before that would have been the model bakeries, I think. And Tom Martin. Tom Martin was my godfather. He was a draper, but he sold tables and prams and everything. <laughs> Characters. Well, the main one I'd remember is really Limerick Bill. Limerick Bill lived up in the, what they call the 24. And he was always very poorly dressed. He'd have a big, heavy overcoat and a soft hat. And he'd have maybe a daffodil or a lump of shamrock or all, all of them, a badge or two. And he used to sit on the seat on Train Hill and knit socks. I think he came from Lim he came from Limerick, that's why they called him Limerick Bill. But he had the appearance of being very poor, but I don't think he was I think he came from a quite well off family, which was eccentric. But he was a lovely man. He used to come to our house every Friday for for his dinner. But he was he was always very very pleasant. You were telling me you had a memory of the Civic Yes, I was a I was a small child, I was maybe about six maybe. And we were getting ready to go to Mass one Sunday morning. And I remember very clearly these two Spitfires crossing the bay there, chasing a German bomber. And they actually damaged it and it had to crash land. I think it crash landed at Carriglan. But the men weren't, well, they could have been injured all right, but they weren't killed. They were arrested. They were brought in for breakfast first in Charlie Powers. <laughs> And then, the, then the the guards came to arrest them, and they were sent to the Curra for the duration of the war. My brother actually cycled out and came back with a bit of the plane, a tiny bit of it. That's around the same time as the, the garret. Yeah, I don't really remember that, but I, I heard about it. A mine was found on the beach, was washed in, and. The man brought it up to the garage, Reggie's garage, John Reggie's garage. And there was copper and brass on this. The lads didn't know what it was. There was three or four boys there, young boy, young men. And they hammered at it to get the copper and the brass off. And the thing exploded. And my father, I think, was at his lunch and was called. He was in the uh, Red Cross at the time. He was called to the scene, but... One man was killed, I think his name was Coffey. I can't remember the other lads' names. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> My son said to me one day, really don't we have much better time than you had? I said, not at all. I said, when I was your age, we used to go to a dance nearly every night. Well, it seemed to be every night. 
and two sessions on a Sunday. I said nine to twelve and one to four. I was exa I was exaggerating a little bit. So he said, you mean in the afternoon? I said, no, no, I mean at night. <laughs> we used to go for a swim in between the two sessions, back in for more. Of course, there was only uh, a lemonade bar there. There was no drink then. The boys wouldn't come in till after they'd had their, their supper drink somewhere else. But the dances, the music used to be great then, the Clipper Carltons and all those. And the Royal Show Band I'd have been at too. My day. Then Great days. That, Great times. So well, uh, much later. Not, not until my children were all well grown up. Actually, it was one of them brought me down to the Grand Hotel for a drink one night. And I realised there was a whole life that I didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Well, Martha's, of course, was there. Or it was Christy Powers then, wasn't it? And the Vic would have been there. The Esquire. The Widow Powers. The Cocoa Powers. I suppose the Avondale. Well, I wouldn't have been down around at all down down the front. We'd have been up the town. And of course, O'Neill's was there as well. That's there forever, isn't it? And Robinson's. That's there a long time, too. What your memories of the, the, the visitors that used to come to The visitors? Gosh, I remember them staying in the Grand Hotel. And, well, the wealthy people would have been staying in the Grand Hotel and bishops and that used to come because they used to come into the shop. And when you went to Mass, the front front. 10 or 12 seats were reserved. I think you paid sixpence to go in those. So it's, the, the locals didn't go there. We were still dealing in pennies and twopences. We went behind that, behind the visitors. But people then, everybody had a, they used to rent out their houses and they used to move into, the, a lot of them moved into their garages. They had done up the garages a bit to make them habitable. And they rented their houses and people used to come to Tremor for a month then, not for, overnight the way they do an hour for a weekend, you know. They used to come for a month and the, the, the wife and the children would stay here and the husband would go to Kilkenny or Tipperary or wherever he was working during the week and come back down for the weekend. They're great times. They have you and the bathing women? The bathing women used to be there with, I think, the, my picture of them is with black shawls around them anyway. And they used to hire out these bathing boxes and they, used, they were on two wheels, two big wheels and a handle, two big handles, and they wheeled them out to the edge of the water. And the person got changed in the bathing box and stepped out and into the water. It was all very discreet and back in again. And the bathing woman bought them for an extra penny or two a bucket of water to wash their feet so they wouldn't have sandy feet. The rest of us had to go home with sandy feet. <laughs> But we did a lot, we went swimming a lot in the summer over the pier and in Newtown Cove. We learned to swim in the pier, I suppose, and all my children learned to swim in the pier. Um, Great times. What were the amusements there? Uh, the amusements were there, there was um, swinging boats and hobby horses and what do you call those ones that the... What do you call the one with the, with the chair? Chairplanes. I remember making my confirmation and I was with Agnes Brennan, Sean Brennan's sister. And we were in a swinging boat and I suppose they weren't busy so they didn't push us off it and we, were, we, sw we swung on the swinging boat for half about an hour and I was violently ill after it. <laughs> we only got down when we felt sick. <laughs> Gosh. Went to school the train in Waterford, yeah. Not at all, never. Never, no. Just to school and back home again, that was it. We hardly ever went to my mother used to go in shopping every Tuesday, I think. To, to Chapman's, she used to go to buy ch cheese and various exotic things. 
And I, smell, I still remember the smell of the coffee in there. Chapman's used to waft down to the quay. It was lovely. It was a lovely shop, beautifully kept. Used to fabulous cheeses there. Mm. You'd be aware of any old superstition stories? Superstitions, well... Do you know, I was coming back from Dublin one day, one night, very late. My son had been conferred that day and we were... We went for a meal or something afterwards, so it was after midnight when we got home. We were driving out from Waterford to Tremor. And I saw something on the road in front of us. I said, what's that? We came up to it. It was a huge deer, a male deer with huge antlers. He must have come down from the mountains or something. I don't know, just at, at um, halfway to Waterford there, you know, where the, all the woods are along there. But it frightened the life out of me. So I thought of ghost stories then, you know, that you'd hear from long ago about donkeys or white horses. There was something about a white horse. Well, there's a lot of old stories in the sand hills about the Goramuka. And you'd be kind of, I suppose, I think, just to frighten us off. They told us those stories, I honestly do. And we used to think Tremor House was haunted because it wasn't being lived at, at the time. And there was, one of the windows was blocked up and we were, to we were told the house was haunted again, I'd say it was to keep us away from it. <laughs> I don't really remember the details. It's a long back. I suppose when my mother wasn't from Tremor, we didn't have that sort of detail, you know. I remember parcels coming from South Africa every Christmas, you know, with dried fruit and that sort of thing dried figs and lovely things, we used to love it, lash into it. Oh, absolutely, everywhere. Oh, yeah, you get lost in it now. It was tiny then, it was only stretched up to... I remember Marion Terrace being built, so St. Otterns was the outside. St. Otterns Terrace was the outside of Tremor, that side, and really Priest Road was as far as it went on the other side, you know. So that whole development out along the cliff hadn't taken place and back all those those housing estates, none of them were there then, you know. There wasn't any housing estates except St. Otterns Terrace then. Um, I need a this is about the helicopter crash. My daughter was actually called out that day because she was in the Order Mall at the time. And she said she remembers running down, running down the back strand, and the, the the mist was so thick that she was holding on to the fireman in front of her. And she said, wondering what they were facing, expecting to see broken legs or broken arms. But when they got near it, they could smell the the, the fuel and the. She said it was awful. But anyway, I only knew. When I was going to work the next morning, I only knew that the helicopter was missing and that they were down looking for it. And as I went up Patrick Street, I saw Freddie Fitzgerald loading up his hearse. I said, oh my God, I said. That's the first I knew. I realised, connected it up then, you know. But anyway, I wrote this poem afterwards about the helicopter crash. I called it Tragedy in the Dunes. Just a mile from my own front door, I strolled along on the glistening shore until I arrived at the tiered sand dunes where an age-old myth tells her fairy tunes. My mind wandered back to a fog-laden night after a search and rescue flight when a stricken helicopter tried to land just yards from the safety of the smoothened sand. Their mission ended in a terrible crash. They hit a high dune with a horrible smash. Four families are left broken and sad, each of them missing a fine young lad. Our little town joins in their unbearable grief. A frightful memory now surrounds our beach. Four Air Corps heroes lost their lives on that foggy and tragic July night in the lovely sand dunes of Tremor, so close to the safety of the Golden Shore. 
the four lads who died in that accident were Captain Dave O'Flaherty, Captain Mick Baker, Sergeant Pat Moody and Corporal Niall Byrne. I gave a copy of, of them to each of the families one, on one of the anniversaries. Down, we were down at the uh, memorial down at the sand dunes and I gave one of them to each family. Like what? <laughs> Anything you want, any other stories you'd like to tell us? About Tremor. I remember, um, I mentioned Stickyback. John Stickyback used to have a cart down on the, on the, on the slip, on the men's slip. It was a white wooden affair with railings on the top and a huge wheel in front and he could push it along and on it he sold windmills the windmills were flying around like that one there flying around and buckets and shovels blow up beach balls it was it was always very colorful it was there beside where the bathing boxes used to be but in later years the bathing boxes were used to store the deck chairs so they used to rent out these deck chairs and the deck chairs you had to unfold them and then there was a kind of a hood for them which was the easiest thing to catch your fingers in those things they were, they were deadly they were deadly the rich people of course had those we sat on on a rug in the sand thank you gary thanks lads um, the poem there, the about, uh, the fairies, fairies fairy tunes. Fairy tunes. What's, what's that? They said that there was uh, the band of the seahorse. You know, the seahorse was a, a, sh a ship that foundered in the bay. And they used to say that music could be heard at the sand hills, and it was the band from the seahorse. Well, I suppose it would have been playing on the ship, yeah, yeah. The, I suppose the regimental band. And, and like that, was there other kind of, with all the different shipwrecks that would have happened in the bay? Was there any other stories? Oh, like there was that? hundreds of shipwrecks in the bay. There was, there was something like 200 shipwrecks altogether. And there was five of the, the wooden carcasses were uncovered in the last winter there, was it? I remember seeing five of them one day. I was surprised I'd only seen four before that. The ribs of the ships, yeah, and one of them was uh, carbon dated to over 200 years ago. And one of them had, uh, it was a wooden ship, and there was wooden dowels even in it, you know. Um, and and the, down the sand hills, I asked you, you asked me earlier and I didn't remember, the, the Gullamuki's garden was there. This, there's a, orchids and that growing down there's little flowers growing wild flowers growing down there and they used to say it was the the fairy garden down there and did you grow up in this house here no no i grew up next door actually my mother was living next door then and when my last brother got married we moved in to be with her but i had six children which was just too much for her and then this house came on the market so we bought this So coming from this area town yeah. and going down and around yeah. or going wherever, yeah. what was it like then compared to now? Once you would have seen walking down, what would that be like? In terms of like the buildings or the streets or the roads or the paths? Well, the road is, the road is very much the same, except for the Japanese gardens, it's the same face virtually. There's very few, well, there's the new houses up, uh, Pan, not Pan Villa, the Pan Villas is new, of course. It was only the houses that were on the road, actually. Gertin Terrace and down there, and we did go down Train Hill. And of course the train would be coming in those days when I was from thousands of people. Hundreds of people used to come on that train. Fathers and mothers and six children, or maybe more. And the mothers would go to the women's slip with the children. And the fathers went to the men's slip. 
So the fathers had a grand time relaxed, re relaxing, and the mothers were left minding the six children. Yeah. Because uh, I've heard people mention different things, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about the different ones? Because, I, like, I, I grew up and it was the beach and the cove and the pier, and that was it. That's all I knew of tomorrow when I was a kid. But there seems to be more than that. Oh, there's the women's slip and the men's slip. Well, there's still the women's slip and the men's slip, but, the, I mean, they're not they're not segregated now, but they were quite strictly segregated when I was very small. And which one was which? The women's was the one nearest, nearest the, the cliff, and the men's was the men's slip under the pram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the new prom was built down in front of where Moe's Cafe is now, the new prom. I, I would still call it the new prom. <laughs> I hate to think how old it is. <laughs> We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had access really, we, we wouldn't have had a car, we wouldn't have travelled. Once I think we went on a picnic to, to uh, where, at the road there, Boat Strand. And there's actually a photograph of us coming back. We got caught by the tide. We, we went in a taxi. I think it was Eileen Welch's husband's taxi. And... Um, we got caught by the tide anyway, and we had to carry my little brother, the two little brothers, through the through the water, us bigger ones, back back to the pier. That's the only time I ever remember going. But you didn't go outside. You didn't need to go outside Tremor. Tremor is the biggest playground in the world, the whole beach. We had a ball down there. Even my own kids, in their ten, they made you know during the horse show, they'd make jumps down in the beach. Four, four falls if, if you fell, three falls for a refusal. <laughs> they, used to, they used to have great fun, the boys. What would you use to make jumps? The kids used to make jumps with buckets and shovels and things, or with sand, you know. They used to, they used to have sand, um, sandcastle making competitions as well, you know. I remember one of my daughters making a, a canoe one time down there, building a canoe of sand and sitting in it. Don't think so, no. Not that I remember. Don't think so, actually. But there, there used to be shops that used to open down the down the Strand Road only in the summer, you know. You know that one beyond the deluxe there? I forget the name of it now. And they'd sell dirty postcards and things like that, which wouldn't be supposed to look at. Dirty poor shorts probably meant fat women or something in those days, you know. Well, someone said to us yesterday that uh, the population of Tamor, when they were young, was about the same as the population of the school now. I think like 1,300 or 1,200? Yeah, oh yeah, too small then. So that's like a major population, but when the influx of people came in, I mean, would it, would it be noticeably different? But what was the difference, say, between summer and winter in Tamor? Well, you know, all the visitors have come. The same people came every year, you know. They come. The same people come the same month every year, even you know. But we didn't. You didn't mix that much with them. I suppose we were kind of cut off from them here, you know. And would there be more of a buzz around the town? Oh well, there, there would be in the in the summer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people came and stayed here. They hadn't transport usually, you know. So they were they were only was walking distance of where they could go to, you know. Especially with the crowd of children, you couldn't walk too far. So it'd be, the beach really was the the main target. During the war, um, this boy, a French boy, was in Rockwell College. I think he was a refugee. Well, he was, yeah, a refugee from Paris. And he was at school in Rockwell. And he came home here, he came he here with my, one of my brothers for the holidays in the summer, no, not in the summer, at Christmas and at Easter. I would have been small at the time, it was about 1943, I'd say. 
I'd re- I, but I can remember having to speak very clearly to him so he'd understand what we were saying. And I was only besides a knee of there. Uh, he was about 14 or 15, I suppose. But my brother, he, he, there wouldn't have been food in Paris. For, there was sort of a blockade on. Food was very scarce in Paris at the time. So he was over here. And I have two letters that my father wrote to his father explaining what a good boy he was and how well he fished in with the family. But afterwards, my brother, I mean, I'm talking about 60 years afterwards, my brother looked him up and met him in France and went to stay with him in his, he had a, a, a wine farm, a grape farm, vines, grape vines, in the south of France. He went to stay with him and he wrote, a, he actually wrote a book about his experiences and included being in Tremor. Pierre was his name, Pierre Gaufre. You have copies of those letters, yeah? Hmm? You still have those letters? I have the actual letter. Two of them, yeah. My father explaining that he, his French wasn't good enough to write, that he could understand what your man had written, but his, what the French man had written, but he, he wasn't good enough, but that the boy had told him that he could, that his father would be able to get it translated. Just reassuring him that the boy was well and getting on well. Gosh, I remember being brought, Dr. Toomey bringing us in his car out to Brownstown. He must have been visiting a patient out there. And there was two of us, and we were told to lie down in the back seat and not to sit up because the doctor was given, um, he had a petrol allowance, you know. But petrol was rationed then, like everything else. I mean, I remember the food being rationed tea and sugar and clothing was rationed. Clothing included sheets or towels or you couldn't get anything like that only so much, you know. So our clothes during the war, my aunt used to make little skirts with little pinafore tops out of my father's old trousers for us. And then she'd put put rick rack bread on it to decorate it. So we thought we were gorgeous. And all our jumpers were re-knitted wool, you know, if you got too small, you you ripped it out and you re-knitted it again. And was it ever the case, I've heard of people before, like, uh, I suppose smuggling is one word for it, but that would be, say, if tea was in short supply, it'd be something that you could go to. Yeah, I, I was too young to know that. But we had a few, we had a few perks from, from having the shop. We had things like um, condensed milk we could get because they'd have it for babies. We used to love the condensed milk. My mother came down one morning and said, lined us all up, seven of us. Who stole the condensed milk? Not me, mummy. Not me. Not me. And it was you. No, honestly, mummy, it wasn't me. I tried a big white all around my mouth. <laughs> Gave the game away. I was caught rotten. <laughs> Like that with the, with the shop, would you remember the, the people who would have come into the shop team? Would you be working in there or even around that you'd remember people coming and going? Not, not when we were children, but I would when I was... Uh, my, I would have had to serve my time when I, when I was quite young, you know. But the customers, the people were lo- lovely and I, all my life I worked in a pharmacy and uh, the people were lovely. The customers were... Oh, oh, Without exception, I'd say, they were all very nice. For one or two, mind you, you'd be glad to be finished with, but most of them were lovely. I would have been nearly that thing that you could tell uh, who was going to buy what nearly, you know? Oh, you would, yeah, yeah. In those times, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd know exactly. You really have it ready and everything for them coming in, You would sometimes, yeah, yeah. But things have changed so much, you know, there was... In those days, we had to make up all our own bottles, you know, from scratch cough bottles and tonics and all that I remember making. We used to make a big, huge big bottle of cough mixture in the batch, you know. And then decanted, we had our own cough mixture, which was very effective actually. But the, I mean, drugs are so effective now compared to what they were then. I mean, that was before 
at the very start of antibiotics, really. What will go into the coffins? Hmm? Do you know what will go into the coffins? God. Well, you make it a base, a base of syrup anyway. You boil the water and sugar first, make a thick syrup. I'm sure the syrup alone probably did soothe the, the throat as much as anything else, you know. But oh, there was fairly powerful stuff in it already. Um, I suppose just the, the last, last question from my end of things then as well. Um, the Tremor, the way Tremor is now, as you're looking at the town and kind of looking around the place, Yeah. is there anything you can still see now of the old Tremor that you would have known that's still, that's still present? Uh, well, the centre of the town is very similar, really. All the way down here. Of course, there used to be cherry blossom trees up the hill here. They were beautiful. Up Pond Road, down Pond Road. Patrick Street is the same. There's no change really in Patrick Street. Main Street is much the same, really. There's very little change around the, the, the centre there. That would have been the heart of Tremor, the cross, where the V is now. That would have, that would have been Tremor. And the Grand Hotel, it's a pity to see the Grand Hotel in such a state as it is. It's tragic. That was a beautiful hotel. The Majestic is, is still well kept. I like that. Would there... Um I think people said there was some more for it, that there's like nearly uh, streets, like uh, one, let's say a gang or group would be from one street. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Would there be different areas like that in Tremor? Oh, there was, yeah. What, yeah. what ones were they? Can you remember? They used, they did have, that. the boys used to have, uh, I don't know, was it hurling or football matches? St. Arthur's Terrace, Patrick Street, Queen Street. Sure, each street would have a whole... You could get a team from each street. There was someone like the Kellys in Queen Street. There was, I don't know how many of them, 12 or 13 of them. Do you know? Families were big in those days. Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. With great freedom then, you know. You could go anywhere in, in relative safety. Well, people people can't let their children do it now. Well, about traffic, you couldn't nowadays anyway, you know, but those days where there's no traffic around. Very few cars. We were out on our bikes. Off out for the day then? Yeah, yeah. Just go off out the country on picnics and that. I remember we get caught and went out to Moon Boy for a picnic one day. I had all the younger children with me. We got caught in a most almighty shower. We were drenched. We sheltered under the trees, but we couldn't shelter enough. Got absolutely soaked. Came back wet and miserable and cold. I remember being given cocoa and put in a hot bath and being put to bed. There were about six of us. <laughs> Come on. Okay, okay. No, it's okay. Hmm? It's, one, it's wonderful hearing the, the old memories and the, the way that life was. I'd probably think of things afterwards that I should have said. That's you nice. know? That's yeah. Nice. Yeah. We'll come back out to you <laughs> <laughs> This is Neve. She's very shy. Aren't you, Neve? When she was born, she was crying one day. And the big sister said, Mummy, would you ever take the batteries out? <laughs> she had these dolls that cry, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's brilliant. Good. Thanks a million.